Hi, welcome to this Refugee Law Initiative Conference panel session on surrogacy and the refugee definition. My name is Kate Jastrom at the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies at the University of California in San Francisco, where I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy. I'm also a lecturer at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. It's my pleasure and honor to moderate this panel. This session will explore growing doubts in refugee law over whether the notion of surrogacy has a substantive role in interpreting the refugee definition. Today's discussion is concerned only with one aspect of the surrogacy debate. We will not be touching on whether it properly describes the role played by the host state under Articles 2 to 33 of the Convention, what might be called its external dimension. We're solely concerned today with surrogacy as the notion that refugee protection steps in when national protection fails. Full details of the panel, including our panelists' abstracts, can be found in your conference program starting on page 28. Our speakers today will present key perspectives on different aspects of the issue, after which we'll open up for broader discussion and your questions and comments. Each of the three speakers will have 15 to 20 minutes for their presentation, which I've been asked to enforce strictly. During the session, please pose your own questions and comments in the, to the speakers in the chat. After the presentations are over, there'll be time for us to discuss and reflect on your questions and comments. This session, as you know, is being recorded and will be posted on the RLI website as a podcast. I'll introduce each speaker before they present, starting with Professor Goodwin Gill. Please know that RLI has insisted that these introductions be as brief as possible. So I will in no way do justice to any of them or I could indeed take up our entire time in this session. So very briefly, Professor Guy S. Goodwin Gill is Emeritus Professor of All Souls College, Oxford, Emeritus Professor of International Refugee Law, University of Oxford, Honorary Associate, Oxford's Refugee Studies Center, and Honorary Professor, Keller Center for International Refugee Law in Sydney. From 2002 to 18, he practiced as a barrister at Blackstone Chambers, London. He is a recipient of Berkeley Law's Riesenfeld Award for his contributions to international law and international refugee law. The author of many articles and chapters dealing with the movement of people between states, his most recent book, is the fourth edition of the Refugee and International Law. Professor Goodwin Gill, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you, Madeleine, and thank you, Hugo, for, uh, for convening this, this session. Surrogacy is object and purpose of the 1951 Convention is the subject I want to address. In what follows, I interpret surrogacy as the idea that the Convention provides a sort of alternative or subsidiary protection when all else fails. It's a notion that I reject categorically. First, though, we need to consider in general what is meant by the object and purpose of a treaty. The law of treaties, the object and purpose of a treaty means those reasons for which the treaty exists, sometimes termed in the language of Grotius and Vertel as the ratio legis or the treaty's raison d'etre. As with all things, the object and purpose of a treaty is in essence subjective, although that does not mean free range of anyone who wishes to suppose that this or that idea or notion is properly to be considered as the, the or an object of purpose. It means subjective within the law. And the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties provides an objective framework for this subjectivity, namely the text of the treaty itself. From the perspective of international law, it's clear that the drafters of the Vienna Convention intended a single overarching notion referring to the treaty as a whole, and not therefore a piecemeal article by article approach that leads to a multiplicity of ideas. To suggest that surrogacy is the object and purpose, or is one among many objects and purposes of the 1951 Convention, is to misunderstand totally the role of object and purpose in international law. By no means known to international law can surrogacy be adduced as the object and purpose of the 1951 Convention, whatever the views of municipal lawyers. For international law, as I have mentioned, the ultimate guidance is to be found in the Convention itself. So what is the object and purpose? It is to give effect to the common intention of the parties, 
1951, as understood in light of later ratifications. So where to look? The full title of the 1951 Convention, the preamble, the text of the Convention, and the travel preparatoire are each of them potentially good places to start. In the asylum case in 1950, the International Court of Justice selected the preamble to the 1928 Havana Convention as the source of the object and purpose of that convention. First, let's look at the title. It is a convention relating to that status of refugees, and that tells us something. It's not about the causes of and responsibility for refugee movements, but as we can see from the preamble, it's about the status and treatment of those who, in a state party, are determined to be refugees. Secondly, certain key terms and phrases emerge from the title and the preamble together. These include status, which I've already mentioned, and then fundamental rights and freedoms without discrimination, further to the UN Charter and the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The drafters state their intention to revise and consolidate previous agreements relating to the status of refugees and to extend the scope and protection accorded. Now, for good order's sake, I need to mention the references to international cooperation and to preventing the refugee problem becoming a cause of tension between states, but I'll leave those aside for one moment. Taking the title of the convention and the preamble as indicative, the object and purpose of the treaty may be summed up as follows. To ensure that those with the status of refugees now since 1967, including those who would otherwise be caught by the date line of 1 January 1951, to ensure that the status of refugees and that they are protected in the territory of states parties and that they enjoy human rights without discrimination, including the essential right of the refugee, the unity of the family. Nothing, therefore, about surrogacy or about the primacy of domestic protection, substitute protection or subsidiarity of protection, nothing at all. Nor is anything said about the refugee definition, which is left to states to interpret and apply. In general, as the international lawyer Jan Klavis has pointed out, object and purpose is used as a direct measure of the legality of state behavior. Behavior is tested directly against the object and purpose of the treaty, in addition to, or instead of, its substantive provisions. So, for example, the United Kingdom's agreement or proposal to send asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing is manifestly a violation of the object and purpose of the 1951 Convention. Sometimes things take place that dra treaty drafters simply cannot envisage, as Clabbers mentions. And again, Clabbers uses the attacks on and mining of ports in the Ni 1986 Nicaragua case as illustrative of actions that were not expressly prohibited by the Treaty of Friendship, Commerce and Navigation, but were seen by the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, as undermining the bonds of peace and friendship which the treaty had indeed intended to serve. Now, in the case of interpretation, object and purpose has a particular role described in Article 31 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, which provides that interpretation is to be pursued in good faith on the basis of the ordinary meaning of the terms of the treaty, considered in context and in light of the treaty's object and purpose, not objects and purposes, note. Potentially, this raises the possibility of two methods that may even lead to different results. Again, in Claber's words, a textually plausible interpretation may collide with a construction based on the object and purpose of the treaty, which makes it especially important to identify the object and purpose and not to yield to the words of municipal lawyers who talk of the primacy of domestic protection or of municipal judges prognosticating in municipal tribunals who may, we are told, employ language such as substitute protection although generally without care as to meaning or usage. The danger of assuming wrongly, as I argue, the object and purpose is or includes surrogacy leads or may lead to excessive focus, as in Horvath, the case I'll come back to in a minute, on the again assumed capacity of the state of origin effectively to protect the claimant as against the risk or risks to which he or she continues to be exposed. Surrogacy therefore operates to restrict the interpretation of the refugee definition. And in that respect is itself inconsistent with the object and purpose of the Convention. Certainly, in Wemhoff, the European Court of Human Rights was of the view that given that the European Convention is a lawmaking treaty, it is also necessary to seek the interpretation that's most appropriate in order to realize the aim and achieve the object of the treaty. However, 
by implying rules that are not explicitly contained in the text, the two different functions, legislative and adjudicative, are confused. And it is the duty of the court to interpret, not to revise, as courts have made clear in multiple judgments over the years, including the Roma rights case in the House of Lords. Surrogacy is thus manifestly not within the concept, the object and purpose of the 1951 Convention, which is to ensure that those defined as refugees are protected in the territory of a state's party and they enjoy their human rights without discrimination, including the right to family union. A refugee, it will be recalled, is defined as someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of their nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties confirms that these words are to be understood in their ordinary meaning, seen in context and in light of the object and purpose of the 1951 Convention. Only where there is potential ambiguity or likelihood of unreasonable results may recourse be had to supplementary means, such as the travel preparatoire or to other rules of international law applicable between the, the parties that have been sanctioned by sufficiency of state practice. Is there, in fact, any ambiguity in the meaning of the terms of Article 1A2, such as persecution or protection, as opposed to the normal difficulties in getting factual information and in assessing the well-foundedness of fear? If so, could a notion of surrogacy help, even though it's not mentioned anywhere in the convention? And if the convention is to be viewed as a living instrument, how does surrogacy add to the sum of protection? Let's assume that there are difficulties, and there is space for a notion such as surrogacy. In my view, in fact, the loss of the result of confusion is due to overthinking the issues and the language. Let's look not at the judgment of the Federal Court of Canada in war, supported by the Canadian Supreme Court, which proposed that surrogacy was a fundamental principle, but the 2001 UK House of Lords judgment in Horvath, for it has, rightly or wrongly, been quoted fairly often in later cases of what is often called the Horvath principle or the Horvath standard. First, let us recall the positive, that Horvath accepted that persecution includes not only persecution by the state, but also persecution by non-state actors where the authorities of the state are unable or unwilling to provide protection against the ill treatment which the claimant fears. Let's also note that Lord Hope took up Lord Lloyd's analysis in an earlier case of ADAM of the refugee definition in terms of two tests, namely the fear test and the protection test. In Lord Hope's view, the two tests are, I quote, nevertheless linked to each other by the concepts which are to be found by looking to the purposes of the convention. The surrogacy principle, he said, which underlies the issue of state protection is at the root of the whole matter. Here you will note that Lord Hope steps beyond the bounds of the object and purpose as understood in international law and proposes a linking principle that is either already present in the refugee definition, unwilling or unable to avail of protection, or has no separate claim to be recognized. Secondly, Lord Hope identified a key issue as being where there is sufficient protection against persecution. Is it sufficient, he asked, to meet the standard required by the Convention, that there is in that country a system of criminal law which makes violent attacks by the persecutors punishable and a reasonable willingness to enforce that law on the part of the law enforcement agency? Or must the protection by the state, he went on, be such that it cannot be said that the person has a well-founded fear? To these questions, he replies as follows. The answer, he says, is to be found in the principle of surrogacy. The primary duty to provide the protection lies with the home state. It is its duty to establish and to operate a system of protection against the persecution of its own nationals. If that system is lacking, in the, is lacking, the protection of the international community is available as a substitute. So far, so good. And again, the invocation of the principle of surrogacy at this point adds nothing useful to the refugee definition. It could be omitted and nothing would be lost. It is obiter dicta. 
Fourthly, however, Lord Hope then goes on and adds, with no call to authority, that the application of the surrogacy principle rests upon the assumption that complete protection against such attacks is not to be expected of the home state. The standard to be applied, he continued, is therefore not that which would eliminate all risk and would thus amount to a guarantee of protection. But rather, it is a practical standard which takes account of the duty which the state owes to all its own nationals. And that, I say, that is the problem. A well-founded fear of persecution can be disregarded on this reasoning, consequential on application of the principle of surrogacy in favor of a practical standard that takes account of the state's duty to all its nationals. This is not what the convention requires when it refers to a refugee with a well-founded fear of being persecuted who is unable or owing to such fear unwilling to avail himself of the protection of their country of origin. The House of Lords has distanced itself from the fundamental question, which is the risk of relevant harm to the claimant by giving undue emphasis to the state and to its efforts to provide a reasonably effective and competent police and judicial system that operates compatibly with international standards. There are many good reasons to distrust the centrality of surrogacy in the context of refugee status determination. To paraphrase Andrew Clapham, the only criterion is whether the asylum seeker will be subject to a relevant risk of harm from either the state or a non-state actor. Nor has reference to Horvath died off entirely in recent years. In ZV Lithuania in 2021, However, the court invoked the Horvath standard and relied upon the sufficiency of protection, the willingness of the state to provide a reasonable level of protection. It also said that the effectiveness of the national system is to be judged normally by its systemic ability to deter and to prevent the persecution of which there is a risk, not just the punishment after the event. Still, the court here did leave open the possibility of a well-founded fear, even where the state meets the systemic case where the authorities know the claimant are, and are in fact unlikely to protect them. In practice, courts in various jurisdictions have tended to avoid dwelling on surrogacy as having any semantic reference and have accepted what counts as risk assessment on a personalized basis by reference to the facts and to the applicant considered in social and political context. Although there is nothing of or not much in the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union, for example, suggests that surrogacy permeates interpretation of the refugee definition, or that surrogacy is an underlying principle. It seems to have found some fertile ground in the opinions of one or two advocates general who've also come at it through the EU principle of subsidiarity. It's an opinion, in his opinion of 12 May 2021 in case C91 20, for example, Advocate General Richard de la Tour appears to take for granted that being unable or unwilling to seek protection reflects the principle of subsidiarity of international protection. A surrogate protection granted where and so long as the country of origin is unable to protect the claimant against the risk of persecution or serious harm. However, when you turn to the judgment of the court in that case, we find the Grand Chamber making no reference to surrogacy at all. And there's no suggestion in its judgment that it permeates interpretation of the refugee definition or in any way qualifies the normal processes of risk assessment. There is certainly no body of settled jurisprudence which would justify invoking surrogacy as an interpretive tool and preferring it to plain straightforward approach to fear and to risk due to the lack or absence of protection. In, in conclusion, therefore, Surrogacy as a key principle, or whatever, inclines to distract the decision maker from the, their principal task, which is to assess the likelihood of harm for convention reasons. Surrogacy may underline the regime of international protection as a whole, but the refugee definition itself is adequate to its purpose and does not need the addition of superfluous elements. If there is a fear of persecution and a risk of harm, whether, whether protection is available is a second level issue. Whether the state is able and willing to provide such protection to a degree sufficient to negate the fear is a question largely of fact and likelihood. One does not need surrogacy to integrate the issues of fact into the decision. Surrogacy as a concept in the determination of refugee status is not worth exploring, other than to reject it, of course. 
nor is it worth looking into how it may or may not depend on other ideas. In my view, no decision maker should ever employ surrogacy in their reasoning. No decision maker should find against a claimant because it is assumed that protection is available locally and that such protection is as good as it gets, and that's good enough. That alternative protection that is refugee status is not required. No decision maker should begin their reasoning with the assumption that risk to the claimant can be ignored because the state of origin is doing its best to deal with the threat of persecution. No decision maker should take surrogacy as somehow or other part of, or indeed itself, the object and purpose of the 1951 Convention. It is not, nor can it be, an international law sets that stage. Thank you. Thank you, Professor goodwin -Gill. Um, And thank you to the audience member who has already put a question in the chat, and I encourage others to do so. We'll hold them until after everyone has spoken. I'll now introduce Dr. Garlick again, very briefly. Dr. Madeline Garlick is Chief of Protection Policy and Legal Advice in the Division of International Protection at UNHCR headquarters in Geneva. She served in Iraq, in Brussels, in Cyprus, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She teaches on an occasional basis at Sciences Po Paris and the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford. She's qualified as a barrister and solicitor in Victoria, Australia. Dr. Garlick, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Kate. And I'd also really like to thank the RLI for the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure and a privilege to take part in this panel with such renowned experts and I'm honored to say friends. UNHCR has not pronounced itself in the form of an official labeled position or detailed guidance on the issue of surrogacy and refugee law. And that fact in and of itself may be seen as significant, suggesting it's not a central element or a principle in refugee status determination on which UNHCR has felt the need to articulate a view. I'll be making my remarks today thus in my personal capacity, but I'll seek to articulate points that are in line with UNHCR's approach to the refugee definition, including notably as relevant to the exercise of assessing the refugees' well-founded fear of persecution and risk of harm. For the purposes of our discussion, I take the surrogacy notion in some to encapsulate the idea that a person is not in need of international protection if she or he could claim the protection of the state or a non-state actor in her country of origin. I'll posit, based on an analysis of case law as well as some of the leading academic commentary on the issue, that according primacy to the question of state protection does not assist in the accurate determination of claims for international protection. While the existence or otherwise of state protection is relevant to the assessment of international protection needs, in the words of this panel's title, I would say rather it is more of a minor element and an excessive emphasis upon it as reflected in general descriptions of the surrogacy notion can certainly distract attention from the central question of whether a person faces a real risk of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. The small number of key cases that are cited as sources of support for the surrogacy notion, which Guy has averred to, include Ward, uh, and Horvath. And these are cases which come from the none too recent past and exclusively from Western Anglophone jurisdictions. The starting point in Ward, I would argue, is a problematic one if one considers the real life situation in which many refugees find themselves. As the Canadian Supreme Court stated, and I quote, except in situations of complete breakdown of the state apparatus, it should be assumed, and I will emphasize that word, that the state is capable of protecting a claimant. But this, however, is a very limited view of many country situations in which state authorities, which are far from being at the point of complete breakdown, may nonetheless not be able to protect a person from persecution and violence. And we see this worldwide ranging from the Sahel to parts of Central America, to Asia and elsewhere today. The court there went on to admit that this presumption increases the burden on an asylum claimant, but argued that it reinforced the underlying rationale of international protection as a surrogate, arguably a circular reasoning coming into play where no alternative remains to the claimant. In the case of Horbath, by contrast, 
the House of Lords placed significant emphasis on the state and its efforts to operate effective law and order systems. With, it seems, very limited regard for the situation of the individual and the risks that she or he might actually face in practice. Focusing on whether the state was showing reasonable willingness and, quote, doing its best, unquote, this approach overlooked the reality that often that best may not be good enough to protect a person from very serious harm. It's also been suggested in some analyses that beyond these cases, other judicial pronouncements, including in New Zealand and in Advocates General of the CJEU, are said to be largely based or referring extensively to the surrogacy notion that they have improved on this by considering whether practic protection is practical and effective in the individual case. But I'd ask whether this is really an approach that supports the centrality of the surrogacy notion, or is it better understood rather as an approach which simply acknowledges the importance of assessing, first and foremost, whether there remains a risk that is real. Scholarship over recent years has revealed some widely differing perspectives on the issue. Amongst these, I'd refer to some of the numerous commentators who've highlighted that surrogacy can distract attention from the central question of whether a person faces a real risk of persecution linked to 1951 convention grounds. Guy uh, has very eloquently, together with Jane McAdam, pointed out that surrogacy can wrongly shift the focus from the individual as a rights holder, which is central to the 1951 convention's logic, to the actions and capacity of the state. Wilshire, considers that surrogacy can lead decision makers to ask the question of whether there is a failure of state protection up to three different times. Firstly, when considering whether a fear is well-founded. Secondly, in assessing the applicant's unwillingness or ability to, to resort to protection. And thirdly, as an element of persecution. And as such, he argues it confuses the refugee definition and its application, giving surrogacy notion excessive prominence without succeeding in bringing clarity to the analysis of eligibility for refugee protection. David Cantor points out that surrogacy can limit refugee protection to minimalist standards of adequacy, and also that it provides no clearly specified norms regarding international protection from non-state actors. I note in this regard that the idea of non-state actors of protection is one which UNHCR has contested in many situations, where it's been alleged that entities ranging from UN actors, unrecognized authorities, local warlords or gangs, which cannot be compared to the state, are said to be capable of providing protection. Susan Nebo has critiqued the way it shifts the focus from flight from persecution to whether there is a flight rather from the absence of protection. So many of these critics also note, as indeed the House of Lords in Horvath seem to acknowledge that the approach can result in an additional evidentiary burden being placed on the asylum seeker to produce evidence proving a negative, namely that there's not a state or other actor who can protect him or her in the country of origin. And this is of course often going to be something extremely difficult for asylum seekers to demonstrate, necessitating deep insight into the workings of the state and its institutions, which extends far beyond the question of what immediate danger of persecution does she or he have, of which she or he has a well-founded fear. Emphasis on the surrogacy concept also creates scope for an excessively broad approach to and use of a, the perceived internal flight or protection alternatives as grounds for rejecting claims for international protection. The surrogacy notion by focusing attention primarily on what protection capacity a state may have or may, may have in some corner of its territory can lead decision makers away from the central question of what risks pertain to the individual and the, noting that these may be wide ranging and mobile. In a time where UNHCR observes many states resorting for the, to the internal flight or internal protection alternative in an effort to argue that asylum seekers should be expected to return to a part of their country of origin from which they did not come, where they have no links or support systems, and where the reach of state institutions is questionable or unclear. This is highly problematic. In addition, I draw attention to the legal and conceptual distinction between the role of a country of asylum on the one hand, which according to the convention requires provision of international protection and enjoyment of specific convention rights, only some of which are applicable on the same basis as nationalism 
and the relationship of the country of origin to its citizens on the other. Some might ask whether the arguments I've set out here are in conflict with part of the UNHCR handbook, which in its paragraph 100 states, wherever the protection of the country of nationality is available, and there is no ground based on well-founded fear for refusing it, the person concerned is not in need of international protection. I would argue rather that this paragraph rightly highlights the relevance of state protection as part of the overall assessment, but crucially also points to the central question of whether there is a ground based on a well-founded fear for a refugee to decline to resort, or in the words of the handbook, to refuse that protection. The second element, I would argue, changes fundamentally the inquiry. Even if state protection may be available in some form, the important question is whether a well-founded fear of persecution remains. If, that risk, if a risk persists that gives rise to such a fear, then the state protection does not negate the need for refugee protection. Thus, the central question relates to risk and not exclusively or primarily to the existence or absence of state protection. So I would argue that against this background, there's significantly greater value in a risk-focused approach to assessing international protection needs, which does not seek artificially to complicate the process by reference to the potential capacity of states or other actors. It, uh, I would argue that excessive emphasis on the notion of surrogacy does not therefore contribute in a far reaching or useful way to the already challenging task of assessing international protection needs. Thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Garlick. Um, and thank you to those who are starting to put some questions and comments um, in the chat. I encourage you to continue to do so. Now allow me to introduce our final speaker and to thank him for proposing and coordinating this panel. Dr. Hugo Story has recently retired as a judge of the Upper Tribunal in the UK and as a research fellow at the University of London. He is a founding member of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges and currently heads their project to update core judicial training materials on asylum law in the EU member states. He has published widely on human rights, refugee law, international law, and European law issues. His forthcoming book is The Refugee Definition in International Law. Dr. Story, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, uh... When, when scholars as eminent as uh, a Guy and Madeline, not to mention others, uh, oppose or doubt something in refugee law, the rest of us must fear to tread. But in my respectful view, uh, they are wrong on this occasion. Um, and can I make five points? First of all, um, and it, it's clearest in, in Guy's uh, uh, abstract, uh, when he says that surrogacy is not a, a criterion and uh, the only question under the refugee definition, and that was supported by Madeline's position, is risk of harm. But surely that's reductionist. Both agree, as far as I understand, that one component of persecution is protection against that harm. Uh, if there is protection against harm, there is not persecution. But already, by this recognition, there is acknowledgement, in my view, of the surrogacy criterion, because the premise behind making protection a, a, a crucial element is that a person cannot qualify as a refugee if they have national protection. So how is surrogacy not a criterion? How is it uh, superfluous? Or how is it something which is relevant but not a, a criterion to uh, use the language that um, Madeline uh, uh, used. Just, just to mention in terms of the interrelationship between persecution and protection, uh, I'm, I hope I'm not putting words into uh, Guy's mouth, but just to quote from uh, his recent edition with Jane McAdam of uh, The Refugee and International Law, Page 70, fear of persecution and lack of protection are themselves interrelated elements. 
So the second point I want to uh, go to is that both claim in, in, in different ways that there's an absence of the notion of surrogacy in contemporary jurisprudence. Uh, Guy says the courts in various jurisdictions have avoided dwelling on surrogacy as having any semantic reference. And Madeline says there's only limited and generally older case law exclusively from Western Anglophone jurisdictions. But in my view, that's not the full picture. I mean, just first of all, to think about um, uh, post Horvath common law jurisprudence, it may be that the classic explanations of the principle are still to be located in the 1993 case of Ward and the 2000 case of Horvath. But jurisprudence in both Canada and the UK continues to endorse the analysis in these cases. So, for example, take uh, a decade on the UK Supreme Court, of, uh, court case of H.J. Iran, where Lord Hope uh, said in paragraph 12, the convention provides surrogate protection, which is activated only upon the failure of state protection. The failure of state protection is central to the whole system. It is true uh, uh, that there are relatively uh, few express references to the notion of surrogacy these days, but in my view, that's simply because it is treated as a given. It's an underlying premise. And in particular, I think it is what frames contemporary protection analysis as conducted in Canada, the UK, Australia, and indeed the US. Uh, and I'll come back to that when talking about um, refugee status determination reasoning, but uh, in New Zealand, um, Although with reference to a 2002 case, Bruce Burson wrote in 2016 uh, that the New Zealand position is as follows. And he said the centrality of the concept of a surrogacy in New Zealand RSD has not therefore, as Goodwin Gill and McAdam feared, led to an approach under which the actions taken by the state are given preferential focus in the inquiry Rather, the predicament of the claimant takes center stage. Indeed, the approach taken in Horvath was expected, expressly rejected because it concentrated not on the risk to the claimers, claimant, but on the reasonable willingness of the state of origin to operate its domestic protection machinery. Just as New Zealand refugee law has insisted on an entirely objective standard on the assessment of risk, so it has insisted on an objective assessment of the adequacy of state protection. So what about civil and continental jurisprudence? Well, it really is a comparative law exercise to, to see what is actually there, but I certainly don't think it's true to say that it's nowhere to be found. And I think um, Guy has perhaps alluded to this, the, the fact that in, in uh, the continental jurisprudence, they talk about the, uh, the subsidiarity of protection, and that uh, certainly seems to be the case in German jurisprudence. And there is a 2008 uh, Swedish Migration Court of Appeal case which referred to subsidiarity of protection as an internationally recognized principle and as a fundamental principle of asylum law. So then we come to EU asylum law, uh, and, and, and Guy has written in his abstract and spoken today about that uh, by reference to uh, uh, advocate general opinions. But if one goes to the EU Commission proposal for the, the, the qualification directive itself, uh, the Commission identified it as a fundamental uh, principle in 2001. And I would say that it is uh, what is meant by uh, the Court of Justice in the joint cases uh, in Abdullah, uh, and more recently, where the actual term subsidiarity of protection is used in the case of LW uh, against Germany in 2021. So the, the, the third point I, I want to make goes to uh, Guy's claim that the notion is not applied in practice. Uh, and what I've already said about the criterion issue and the jurisprudence will help explain why I also disagree that courts and tribunals do not draw on the principle of surrogacy in their reasoning. It may be that the actual term is rarely used, 
but the concept underlying it is integral to the modern protection analysis applied by courts and tribunals, uh, especially when addressing cases involving threats of persecution from non-state actors. If I'm examining, for example, whether a victim of trafficking has a well-founded fear of being persecuted, one criterion I must apply is whether they will receive effective protection on return to their country of origin. I must inevitably focus on whether the authorities of the state in that country will be able and willing to protect. Uh, that is only part of the analysis of well-founded fear of being persecuted, but it is an essential part. And such analysis only makes sense because of the underlying premise that if there is national protection available, the applicant will not qualify. So to my mind, it is part and parcel of everyday judicial reasoning around the globe. And indeed, uh, to my understanding, uh, it's also part and parcel of everyday uh, UNHCR refugee status determination, uh, as well as uh, that employed by many first instance decision makers. So my fourth point um, relates to Madeline's statement, and she's come back to it herself, that uh, in her abstract that UNHCR has not pronounced itself in the form of an official position or detailed guidance on the issue of surrogacy in refugee law. Uh, and she's absolutely right, there's no detailed guidance but I would disagree that UNHCR has not pronounced an official position. I think UNHCR has pronounced that in paragraph 100 of the handbook to which Madeline herself drew attention. And just to repeat what is said there, whenever the protection of the country of nationality is available and there is no ground based on well-founded fear for refusing it, the person concerned is not in need of international protection and is not a refugee. Um, I, I further think that it's uh, integral to uh, the UNHCR guidelines on international protection, take those on trafficking uh, and those on sexual orientation and look at what is said about the protection analysis uh, in the context of a uh, harm from non-state actors. Um, so finally, might I address the claim made by both uh, Guy and Madeline that the notion of surrogacy is a distraction or imposes uh, additional burdens. Uh, and I hope I've already explained why that can't be the case, at least in as much as a protection inquiry must be part of every refugee status determination inquiry. But what they seem to have in mind is saying, in saying this is that the notion is hopelessly entangled with a number of discredited positions that it displaces the role of the individual, gives undue emphasis to the state, shifts the focus from the individual as rights holder to the actions and capacity of the state, entails reliance on the uh, idea that if the state is reasonably willing to operate an effective legal system or doing its best, uh, or on the idea that it is somehow incumbent on applicants to exhaust domestic remedies or to establish state responsibility or to operate a presumption of state protection. And Madeline has added uh, concerns about distortion of the application of the internal flight or internal protection alternative. Uh, and it's propping up as she sees it of the misguided notion that non-state actors can protect. Well, that's a long list of misdeeds. Um, so let's just take the most high profile one of these. Uh, ideas, and that's these, this concept of reasonable willingness to protect, of the state to protect, uh, which, which Guy uh, quite properly uh, dwelt on. And I would accept that if you look at the reasoning of the court in Horvath, that they did fixate on protection analysis divorced from individual assessment, uh, and then they went on uh, to frame uh, the protection analysis in a restrictive way as a test of reasonable willingness. But the fact of the matter is that um, in both uh, Anglo-Saxon and EU case law, the solution has not, in, in general, been to ditch protection analysis, but to reframe it in terms of effective protection understood as an intrinsic part of establishing whether there's a well-founded fear of being persecuted. 
and one driver for reframing it is greater awareness of the need for individual assessment or what Guy has referred to as personalized risk assessment. Uh, and the reason why in general um, courts and tribunals in the UK, and, and obviously not all because Guy has pointed to a, a 2021 case said uh, against Lithuania, but in general, uh, post Horvath, courts and tribunals in the UK felt able not to uh, continue this uh, uh, way of framing the protection analysis because the, uh, their lordships in, in Horvath had themselves said that the assessment is holistic and that persecution and protection are interdependent context, concepts. So getting rid of the fixation uh, does not mean getting rid of the notion of surrogacy. The latter is a principle that continues, in my view, to underlie the refugee definition as I see it. It is just that to qualify as substitute protection, protection has to be effective and subject to individual assessment. And this is understanding has won out over the formalistic um, reasonable willingness test for, for the most part. Um, and I would uh, add an important caveat to that, that there continues to be examples of bad state practice uh, and glaringly in the latest uh, Nationality and Borders Act uh, in the UK, Section 34, which deals with protection, uh, you have got, uh, in my view, an uh, example of a rather minimalistic framework. So. We're not out of the woods, but I do think in general that the jurisprudence over the years uh, has developed, as I say, a different approach to protection analysis. And that, that is informed by the notion of surrogacy. But, and just to, uh, well, to mention the other points that, 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 that uh, were raised by Guy and Madeline, uh, the other misdeeds that I, as I call them, um, uh, I, I fail to see why they are intrinsically linked to the notion of surrogacy. I, I see them as flawed attempts to, uh, to give uh, the notion substance. Each can be rejected without resiling from reliance on the notion as a criterion. Um, and just to mention the other two points that Madeline raised about uh, internal flight, uh, perhaps we should come back to that in discussion, but I, I'm not sure that I understand her as saying that internal protection uh, uh, or internal, the internal flight alternative should not be part of refugee status determination. And in re regard to non-state agents of, of, as uh, actors of protection, uh, we've, we've got the recent um, Court of Justice case in the EU of OA on that. But in general, I would say certainly within EU asylum law, uh, a human rights approach is developed to the concept of protection. And the, the qualities that protection has to embody in order to qualify as protection include not only ability and willingness, but accessibility, effectiveness, and non-temporariness. Uh, and, and so there, this concern is not demonstrated at least by some important um, state practice. Uh, namely EU asylum law. So to conclude, I would endorse um, Guy's and Madeline's concern to identify and disparage a medley of, of discredited notions, uh, which I outlined earlier and which both of them have touched on, uh, which have often uh, been run in tandem with the notion of surrogacy. But please let us not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Their concerns have force against formalistic, minimalistic approaches to protection, but they do not have force against approaches which require protection to be practical and effective in the individual case. Sure, there continues to be some bad state practice, but there is no indissociable link with the concept of surrogacy. It's taken a lot of effort to achieve greater clarity about the contents of the refugee definition, including the place within it of the protection analysis. And to view surrogacy as some kind of misplaced notion risks unraveling uh, settled case law uh, and undoing progress. And, and just uh, 
to, to finish off, if I may, by just going to Guy's point about object and purpose. Uh, uh, you remember Guy uh, said that uh, surrogacy was not in any shape or form uh, uh, an object and purpose uh, of the Refugee Convention. Um, well, well, first of all, uh, I mean, he himself says it is abstract and he repeated it in his talk um, that um, the, uh, the notion may underlie, may underline the regime of international protection as a whole. Well, perhaps he's drawing some distinction there between international protection as a whole and the refugee definition, but that to me is, looks a bit like an object in purpose. But even if that's wrong, uh, there is certainly, and I think Guy would agree, clearly some differences of view about whether it's an object of purpose, but let's supposing that it's not. I see you shaking your head, Guy, but let's supposing uh, that it's not. We've still got under Article 31 to think about, first of all, ordinary meaning. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the refugee definition, uh, most interpretation construes uh, the reference to protection in the second clause of Article 1A2 as a reference to internal protection, which seems to me to pretty much incorporate the notion of surrogacy. And then we talk about context. Well, we've got the second paragraph of Article 1A2, uh, which deals with uh, multiple nationality. We've got Article uh, 1C on cessation, which refers in, in effect to uh, notions of surrogacy in Article 1E. So if we're talking about um, Article 31 and the approach to interpretation that must be taken, uh, even if we don't have it as an object and purpose, I don't think we've opened, we've completely shut the door to the notion yeah. having some uh, relevance to informing uh, meaning. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Story. Um, and I see there's a lot here to talk about. and. Uh, not only from your own presentations, but from the comments being made on the side here. So we have about 30 minutes left uh, in this session, and um, I will ask each of our speakers in their usual speaking order to take about five minutes to respond either to their fellow panelists or to some of our um, excellent comments and questions in the chat. Um, and then if we have time, we can go through a second round of responses. So to some extent, I hope you can address each other and address the audience directly. And um, we can try to dig a little more into these. So Professor Goodwin Gill, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, I think a lot of the problem arises from listening to Hugo uh, reinforce my view of this, is due to overthinking the issue. If you had taken all mention of the principle of surrogacy out of what Hugo said, you'd have been left with confirmation of the basic protection test. As I said before, surrogacy adds nothing meaningful, it seems to me, to the decision-making process. You don't need surrogacy to get to an assessment of risk to recognition of status. You quoted Hugo Burson, I think if you read Burson, you find that he is supporting Goodwin Gill and Jane McAdam in his description of the role of surrogacy in, or the non-role of surrogacy in New Zealand jurisprudence, not criticizing it. I think it's also important to realize that you cannot just bring in to the, you said objective purpose or object and purpose. I'm assuming you meant object and purpose. You cannot just drag in to the notion of object and purpose of the 1951 Convention any stray notion that you think of. It's got to have a basis in international law, not in the prognostications of municipal lawyers on domestic uh, aspects of protection or municipal judges. It's got to have a basis in international law. And international law establishes the objective basis for determining the object and purpose of the Convention, which is the text of the treaty. So where are you going to get the authority for surrogacy from? None, no, no one refers to this authority. Hope refers to a principle. The Canadian Supreme Court referred to a principle, fundamental principle. 
where is the authority for surrogacy in this in this in this in this in this uh, determination process? Now you could do it from the basis of interpretation. You could say that interpreting the words in the life, their ordinary meaning, is it in context and with re re regard to, due, to the object and purpose of the treaty. Uh, therefore, we need surrogacy, and that's I think the strength. That's the strongest argument you can make for it. That it, it aids interpretation. But does it aid interpretation? That's the question which I raised. I think your answers, in fact, provided adequate ammunition for the fact that it does not provide uh, assistance to the process of determining whether a risk exists. It is not applied in practice. Uh, it is given paid lip service to repetition of, of the Horvath stand, the Horvath test um, adds nothing. Uh, Lord Hope has been rejected. You mentioned H.J. Iran in a recent case in which Lord Hope invoked surrogacy. Uh, but I had categorically rejected his authority to do so in, in my remarks. I think unless you address those remarks and find authority for the proposition other than in municipal law, then I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goodwin Gill. There are other questions addressed um, to you and other panelists in the chat. Um, I will flag just a couple and then turn to Dr. Garlick. So a question about the relationship, um, extending this critique to human rights approach generally, how is surrogacy related to internal protection? This has come up, but I will encourage Dr. Garlick perhaps to address that. Um, also the relationship between surrogacy and voluntary repatriation as a possible solution that was aimed uh, or directed to Dr. Garlick. Um, question about the EU qualification directive, Article 7. Is it not recognized here? And as such, does it not seem to have a wider purchase, at least in Europe? And then finally, I'm going to throw these all out here to pick up what you will. To all speakers, does the use or emergence of the surrogacy idea as applied in refugee law in certain Western legal settings, reflect a wider tendency among some law policy decision makers to avoid engaging with the central facts of refugee cases, preferring instead to use increasingly complex legal artifices as a basis for circumscribing the concept of refugee. This person knows my daily life as a practitioner in the United States. Um, arguably, the uh, same could be said, sorry, that was my editorial comment. The rest of the question continues, arguably the same could be said for the treatment of religious persecution in the CJEU jurisprudence by recourse to purported European human rights concepts. So, um, Dr. Garlick, if you would like to address any or all of those points, you can take a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yastrom. So, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say that listening to Hugo, I think you know, there is quite a lot on which we, we, we seem to agree. Clearly, the, the crucial importance of an individual assessment of risk, that the existence or absence of state protection is part of the assessment of a well-founded fear of persecution. And I think also very clearly that the application of the surrogacy notion has given rise to some very problematic outcomes. I think in Hugo's words, he talked about flawed attempts to give effect to surrogacy. And I think I'd say in that connection that we need to be very careful about a notion that lends itself to such misunderstanding and misapplication. Um, the the uh, question of the internal flight alternatives has come up also in Hugo's remarks, but also in the question. And I think this is, this is very important because what we do see in practice from UNHCR's viewpoint is a very clearly excessive application of this idea that protection is available uh, at the hands of the state or others in many circumstances where decision makers and authorities find that an internal protection alternative is said to exist where, frankly, there is little or no objective evidence that people do enjoy protection of their human rights uh, in any effective sense. We see very problematic instances where states find that it's acceptable to reject a refugee claim on the grounds that people could be returned to underserviced IDP camps in remote areas of countries emerging from conflict, where there's little or no security, and UNHCR knows this because we're seeking also to provide services there that the state is failing to do. And this is not one or two isolated cases. This is 
uh, an approach that really does uh, take an artificial view of the availability uh, of protection in many circumstances, relying in, in principle on the idea that the state is uh, functional. Um, I'd like to pick up on, on David Cantor's question there, where he does indeed, as you flagged, Kate, talk about the risk of a tendency towards using complex legal artifices, which I think we do indeed see uh, uh, where states are looking for ways to carve out exceptions to the refugee definition. And this, I, I fear, is part of the way in which the surrogacy notion uh, it can be applied. Perhaps turning to the question around links to voluntary repatriation and, and surrogacy, I'd emphasize here that voluntary repatriation uh, as a durable solution with, for which UNHCR uh, has a mandate responsibility is, is precisely that. It refers to people who were or may still be in some cases refugees voluntarily elect to return to their countries of origin. And in this connection, it's important to remember that people have a right to return to their countries. And this is something we recognize and respect, even where HCI does not support or promote such return, because we do see many circumstances in which people, for their own reasons, may elect to return in ways that do not negate the reality that other people might well have a fear of persecution, which justifies ongoing recognition of their refugee status. We often see that conditions shift in countries of origin. People may go back, not because they are confident that protection, uh, the protection of their state is available, but because they wish to go and see how conditions will evolve. So I think we don't see uh, any incompatibility there with the idea that there, there can be voluntary repatriation which may or may not be the basis for a durable solution, depending on how conditions um, may evolve. Now, I'd contrast this with a situation where the basis for refugee status ceases, where conditions which gave rise to persecution uh, may have ceased to exist. And this can be the case where the state is in a position to uh, provide effective protection. But uh, the fact of voluntary repatriation certainly does not uh, have this as essential requirement. Perhaps lastly, Jen, turning to Article 7 of the Qualification Directive. This is an article which UNHR commentaries have, where UNHR commentaries have cautioned against the excessive application of its elements. Um, and perhaps just to recall that uh, Article 7 of the Qualification Directive refers to the fact that protection may be provided by a state or also by other actors, including international organizations. Uh, Article 7.2 of the Qualification Directive says protection against persecution or serious harm uh, is generally provided where the act is mentioned above, take reasonable steps to prevent the persecution or suffering of serious harm. And we uh, find that this has led to a number of problematic outcomes where what might be reasonable steps in some circumstances have clearly not been uh, sufficient to protect people against a risk of persecution in practice. So even if uh, Article 7 has provided a broad basis for this idea of actors of protection, uh, we, we find it something that needs to be approached with particular care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garlick. And I do see that Professor goodwin Gillis is hand raised, and I'm going to come back to you, but I first would like to go back to Dr. Storr, unless you, is this like a two-finger intervention? Dr. Kuna. Okay, so you'll let me wait for just a minute. Dr. Story, please uh, go ahead. You've um, been taking <laughs> some brick bats and some bouquets here. So please, um, please respond to some of uh, what's coming up. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kate. I, I've got a, a list of points here, so they're not uh, necessarily in, in coherent order, but um, just to, to quickly go through them, there was a question early on uh, about the relevance of, of a human rights approach uh, to this issue. Uh, and I, I, I think my own answer would be that I think um, international human rights law on non-return broadly mirrors uh, the, uh, the approach that I say is taken in um, most um, uh, contemporary decision-making uh, that there is at work in international 
human rights law or principle of surrogacy as well, in that the view is taken that uh, if the state can obviate uh, the harm and provide protection, then a person is not at risk of ill treatment. Um, now, Guy uh, referred to uh, overthinking, and um, I think that's also perhaps echoed in the question from David Cantor about whether or not there's uh, uh, too much resort to complex legal artifices. Uh, and I would, I would certainly uh, agree. We know from uh, the history of refugee law that there has been uh, quite a bit of what I sometimes refer to as meta-refugee law, discussions about which limb of the definition a certain notion belongs and, and so on and so forth. But I think one of the points I was trying to make is it seems to me that, and I think Horvath and the, the subsequent uh, developments illustrated that these, these concepts were tossed around and what we have as a result after quite a lot of toing and froing is what I've called a, a modern uh, protection analysis, which seems to me underlines most, most everyday refugee status determination in which, uh, yes, you're right, Guy, they're not talking about surrogacy, but they are asking as a, a crucial question in the analysis, uh, is the state uh, protecting against the harm that this individual says they have a well-founded fear of? Um, that to me is surrogacy by another name. And perhaps that links to the question uh, that I think Guy touched on at the outset about, well, maybe it's just the name. Is there something else? Will we rename it? And then might we all feel more comfortable about it? Well, having listened to the discussion today, I'm, I'm inclined to think that perhaps it, 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 it's its problem is the name because you know it almost makes it sound like we're talking about reproduction rights or something like that. Um, but if it if it's if it's basically something to do with um, you are not a refugee if you can be protected by your own state, is it that um, offensive of, of 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 all the uh, the principles that we stand by? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's something in the word that seems to have um, goaded uh, some of the, uh, the refugee scholarship. Um, Guy mentioned uh, that um, on the point about object and purpose, that um, that can't be, you know, any stray notion. And, and I, I uh, absolutely agree with that, but he himself pointed to um, ICJ case law about the importance of the common intention of the parties. Well, if, if you ask um, anyone in the street, what was the common intention of the parties in, in, in uh, creating uh, the refugee definition, is it that um, remote to suggest that the answer might be, well, because they wanted to make sure that people who didn't get protection from their state would be protected? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that um, you can get rid of the object and purpose point that easily, but in any event, a, 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 as I said, I don't think uh, in terms of uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties that everything hangs on whether it's an object and purpose. Now, Madeline, I just want to come back to a point you mentioned in your talk, and I think you, um, about you would agree that surrogacy is perhaps, a, well, relevant or well, the protection analysis, I think you said, is, is relevant. And I think you also picked up on a description that Guy has given of it elsewhere as a minor premise. I think he was referring to the second clause of Article 1A2. But um, I, I would just want to ask this back. How is it not crucial? I mean, is there some category of people who are refugees? People who, uh, in other words, are there some people who can get state protection, but are refugees? Who are they? I'm, they're not known to me, but if, if there are, please tell me, that might help clarify, because to me, it's not just simply relevant or minor premise. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a criterion, you can't get away from it. Um, it. It's part of the concept of being persecuted, whether you receive effective protection. Um, 
and, and just, uh, well, I think I'll leave it there because I don't want to take up all the time. There's obviously a lot that can be said. Thank you, Dr. Story. Um, Professor Goodwin Gill, you wanted to come back in. Thank you. On the human rights side, uh, I would refer anyone who's interested to Andrew Clapham's uh, remarks, which I referred to in my talk. He, they appear in Human Rights Obligations of Non-State Actors, 2006. And I think he encapsulates the position fairly thorough, very thoroughly indeed. Now, I think going back to this overthinking point, I mean, there's a lot of common ground between what Hugo has said and what Matt and I have said. Um, he mentioned, for example, in a trafficking case, if his problem as a decision maker, the challenge facing as a decision maker, is there a risk? Then if there is a risk of persecution, the individual is a refugee. That has nothing to do with surrogacy as such. The danger of surrogacy is the following. The decision maker, as it were, asks themselves, is there a system of protection in place? Gross or modern? If there is, then the person is not a refugee. A risk approach, however, asks, is there a risk of persecution to this individual? If there is, yes, then the person is a refugee. And the difference is that you get these two different decisions potentially two different decisions. Surrogacy leads you down the no refugee path. A risk approach leads you appropriately to a refugee decision, a positive refugee decision. That I think is the danger which surrogacy exists, uh, which surrogacy uh, lead, um, encourages. And I think that's one of the reasons why we need to reject it. Whether you call it something, something else or not, I don't know. But it seems to me that that's the danger that we need to think about. Thank you, Professor Goodman. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Gunn. Yes, thank you, Kate. And, and yes, let me try to argue uh, Hugo's very uh, pertinent question. Uh, and I think indeed, uh, it, the, uh, what Guy has just articulated, I think is a real part of the challenge in this regard. Uh, what we might see, for example, is that Victims in, of trafficking may originate from states where in principle there are systems of law and order in place and where there is a criminal law framework that should be making it possible to prosecute traffickers and to ensure that people are not at risk therefrom. But what we see in many parts of the world, including in Europe, is that there are trafficking rings which are extremely effective and despite good efforts on the part of law enforcement, nonetheless, uh, uh, can succeed in targeting uh, people who have been trafficked before or their family members in, in, in ways that states may not be affected. So I would say that it's really crucial then indeed to be focusing on the individual situation of that person. Now, Hugo would probably say the question there is indeed then the effectiveness of protection. But I think the problem with the articulations of the surrogacy notions, we've seen them in many cases, and as we see, for example, uh, as defined in Article 7 of the Qualification Directive, is that it's focused more on the broad abstract question of whether indeed there are mechanisms that should be able to do this. And so I think indeed this is, this is really at the, the heart of the challenge that we see where these broader concepts are then applied in practice in ways that means that people who are individually at risk uh, and are not able to uh, gain access to protection in practice, may be denied refugee protection in cases where they need it. Thank you. All right, just noting for our panelists and our audience, we have five minutes left. So if people want to um, offer a, a closing thought, or parting, parting words, now would be a good time to prepare for them. Yes, Dr. Story. Well, I, I don't want to have the last word, because I think on this topic, the one clear thing is that the last word is there's no last word. But, but um, I do worry, Guy, uh, about your repeated uh, reference to Andrew Clapham's analysis. Because when I've looked at that, I, I really think that he's 
questioning what I understood you uh, to take as uh, agreed, namely that persecution and protection are in interrelated. Um, and I think in Andrew Clapman was talking about the ECHR in Article 3, and he seemed to be questioning whether you could say that ill treatment and protection are interrelated. And as I've always understood what he said, the logic of that is that they're not related. Um, whereas I think in refugee law, and I would, I, I think, as I said, I think in the, uh, the human rights jurisprudence, uh, persecution and protection are interrelated, ill treatment and protection are interrelated. So I, I'm just worried that in going after this beast called surrogacy, there's a danger of resiling from the very sensible position, which I think um, you and many others have held, that the persecution and protection are interdependent concepts. And I think it'd be very unfortunate if somehow or other that was unraveled. Uh, and the only other point I, I'd make is, is both Guy and, and, and Madeline talked about the, the danger of, of surrogacy and, and pointed out um, how it can be uh, uh, used in trafficking cases or internal protection context. Well, I think for me, these are examples of bad state practice um, that if the protection analysis treats protection as something that has to be practical and effective in the individual case, that's not going to arise. Interestingly, um, Madeline mentioned the text of Article 7 uh, of the EU Qualification Directive on Actors of Protection. Uh, and uh, it, it was, of course, revised in 2011. And if you look at the, the debates in the, in the Commission and, and the other EU institutions about it, there was a, precisely a concern that um, protection might be treated formalistically. And that was one of the reasons why words were added to the first sentence of Article uh, 7.2. Uh, and the, the Court of Justice has reinforced that by emphasizing again and again that it's about individual assessment and that a protection has to be uh, effective uh, and that it's intrinsically linked to the concept of well-founded fear, what uh, you both have talked about as, as the, uh, the, the risk analysis. So I don't see there's a divorce between uh, surrogacy or perhaps better renamed um, absence of um, national protection uh, and um, uh, risk assessment. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you so much. And not to rush, I'm going to thank all the panelists in advance and give the last word to Guy because we're very close to time. And Guy, I think you've got a minute or two. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a great, uh, fascinating uh, series um, uh, in, uh, occasion to discuss these issues with, with Madeline and, and Hugo and, and yourself, Kate. Thank you very much. I just want a few minor remarks. Um, first of all, I'm worried when Hugo starts talking about interdependence because I fear there's another term coming into here, into the discourse here between persecution and protection. Um, we'll leave that to one side for the moment. On the human rights and Andrew Clapham side, let me just read what he says. The whole ethos, writes Andrew Clapham, of humanitarian protection argues against a judgmental approach with regard to the receiving state. The only criterion under human rights law under human rights treaty law is whether the person will be subject to a substantial risk of harm from the non-state actor. If there is such a risk, the human rights treaty obligation on the sending state should prevent such a state from sending individuals into harm. That seems to me clear. And that seems to me not unrelated to the test of persecution and protection. We mentioned bad state practice. Yes, bad state practice, deriving from misapplication, if you like, of the principle of surrogacy, which to my mind is a good reason for doing away with surrogacy, if, if, if possible. And finally, on the object and purpose of the, of the convention, you don't stop anyone in the street and ask them what the object and purpose of a treaty is, unless the street is full of international lawyers, then you might get an answer. Yes, democratization suggests that you should be able to ask the person in the street what the refugee convention is about, and you might get a surrogate answer. But from a legal perspective, at the present day, you need to ask a bunch of international lawyers. Thank you.
Thank you all. I do believe we're at time. Many thanks again to Hugo Story for proposing this panel, to Guy Gubin Gill and Madeline Garlick for engaging so seriously with all this, and to all our participants for their questions and Refugee Law Initiative for bringing us together. Thank you. <laughs>